This is a KGW News special well, edition. Well, I hope that they're able to just see what's possible uh, when they're given the opportunity to participate. What a day to wrap up the Hood to Coast Relay. 19,000 runners representing every state and more than 40 countries. Welcome to this special edition of KGW News at 8. I'm Christelle Kumwe. From Timberline Lodge to the Oregon coast, it was another incredible hood to coast journey for both runners and walkers. Catherine Cook was at the finish line today. She talked with a group of runners with something important to prove. Three, two, one, runners go. Running down the mountain for a race that's now over the hill. The Providence Hood to Coast Relay turned 40 this year and was as epic as ever. They call it the mother of all relays for a reason. 12-person teams, 36 legs, 200 miles. It takes guts and a heart with something to prove. We found that in Team Forest Stump. And we're all a team of just people with disabilities, various disabilities from all over the United States. Travis Ricks lost a leg as a teenager. Yeah. This is about a $15,000 leg right here. Jamie Brown was born without a fibula. They have running prosthetics now, but like so many kids today, they couldn't afford one when they were little. Yeah, most insurance companies deem running prosthetics as a luxury item. Um, well, as we see them now, it's more of a necessity or just a lifestyle for us. And we want to make sure that every kid has the opportunity to be able to given a, be given a running leg um, where insurance companies just cover it just like they would our regular walking legs. So not taking any of that opportunity away from a kid to be a kid. They're doing that through a legislative initiative called So Kids Can Move, an offshoot of their nonprofit Forest Stump. Co-founder Natalie Harold. We're out here just to show what's possible. Red dress Express. Every team has a story. That includes one we're pretty proud of, KGW running footage. That's our general manager, Steve Carter, handing off to reporter Evan Watson. My legs need a day off. Evan ran the first leg, which means first to finish. It was just really fun. It was a great time, and it's cool to see all the camaraderie and all this just encouraging spirit out here as well. KGW had a couple spots to fill, so we looked to our sister station, KUSA in Denver, to help. Producer Allie Heath stepped up. Her great-grandmother summited Mount Hood three times, twice before Timberline Lodge was even built. Sixteen years ago, Allie and her family scattered her great-grandmother's ashes on Mount Hood. This was her first time back. But I could see Mount Hood pretty much the whole time I was running, and it just kind of felt like she was there cheering me on, which felt awesome because she always said, the one thing I can give you is the courage and the strength to keep going on. And kind of every time I felt like I was slowing down a little bit, I'd just look over, and there she was up on Hood. So it kind of felt like a little light shining down on me to keep going. Call her the great-grandmother of all relays. <laughs> on a weekend and a finish line they'll never forget. The Hood to Coast Relay sells out just about every year, but there is a lottery for next year's race that opens October 5th. We'll post more about that and the nonprofit Forest Stump on KGW.com. In Seaside, Katherine Cook, KGW News. Wow, what an experience. Now, meteorologist Chris McGinnis is now joining us. Now, Chris, some runners got a little rain down on the beach, but not here in Portland, right? Yeah, four hundredths of an inch of rain actually last night and early this morning in Seaside, but not a drop here in Portland. More on that in a second. Here's the live look, by the way, from the Oregon coast. The sun is down, but boy, isn't that pretty? This is Cannon Beach, just a little south of Seaside, where no doubt the uh, Post race hood to coast party is continuing and probably will into the evening. All right, I mentioned we haven't had any rain here at PDX, right? 52 days is our current streak without measurable rain. Our last measurable rain, July 6th. We've had traces of rain since, but nothing actually measurable. And I want to go back to the beginning of that graphic because that shows you where we stack up here. Uh, and in very uh, short order here, we're going to be working our way into uh, maybe the top five in terms of uh, duration of dry streaks at PDX. That's really something. It's been a warm summer as well. More on that coming up in a bit. But right now it's pretty out there as the sun slips down below the West Hills. 69 last check at PDX. The plan for tomorrow. We wake up to clouds in the morning, but they will dissipate pretty quickly. Unlike today where they hung on through the noon hour, they will be gone, I think, by lunchtime. And we've got a slightly warmer afternoon with highs in the upper 70s. We get warmer from there. Crystal, I think we've got 90 degree heat back in my 70 forecast. More on that in just a few minutes. Thanks, Chris. 
Now, California is making a major shift toward electric vehicles. The state is banning the sale of new gas cars starting in 2035. It will also force automakers to speed up production of cleaner vehicles starting in 2026. And now Washington Governor Jay Inslee says his state will do the same. That's because in 2019, Washington passed a law saying the state must follow California's zero emission vehicle rules. The next step will be building up infrastructure like charging stations. The state officials say federal aid through the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act will help make it happen. The whole network we have to deliver fuels that gets it to our cars is a completely different system. But once we get that system built, you know, the real advantage of electric cars, aside from the fact that they emit far less pollution, is that uh, they're actually cheaper to operate. We've reached out to the Governor Brown's office for Oregon's plan on this. They told us Oregon is working on a rule similar to California's. The DEQ is set to meet up and discuss it on August 30th. One thing to note, California's ban does not impact existing gas cars. People who already own them can still drive them and sell them used. This only impacts sales of new cars. We have new video tonight from the Powerhurst Gilbert neighborhood. Portland police found a woman dead on Southeast 92nd Avenue shortly after 7 this morning. One man is in custody and the case is still under investigation. PPB initially showed up because of a disturbance call. Authorities have not yet released information about the victim. In Tigard, a suspect is in custody after a standoff near Washington Square Mall. Police say it started with an armed man threatening a woman inside the Greenberg Apartments on Greenberg Road. She made it out okay, but the man barricaded himself in and refused to come out for several hours. That's when police told neighbors to stay inside. The man eventually came outside at 12.30 this morning and was taken to the Washington County Jail. New video is shedding light on a recent police shooting in Hillsborough. We want to warn you, one of the images you're about to see is graphic and may be disturbing to some viewers. Christine Padawanish takes us through what happened. The video shows the events leading up to an officer shooting a man near Southeast 11th and Washington in Hillsborough a week ago. In the video, the orange circle appears to be around the man who was shot, 20-year-old Jose Juan Aguilar Mondujano. The yellow circle is around a police car with Lieutenant Neil Potter inside. Police say the video shows Aguilar Mondujano passing the car. Then after pausing a moment, he heads back toward the police car. The driver, Potter, pulls forward and stops. The front door opens, then a scuffle. Potter in the yellow circle appears to back away as Aguilar Mondujano in the orange circle moves toward him. Police say Potter was knocked to the ground and Aguilar Mondujano continued to attack him and tried to take his gun. At some point, Potter shot Aguilar Mondujano. Police say the initial attack was unprovoked. They released a photo of Potter after the incident. In the picture, Potter is bleeding from the nose. Police say he had broken facial bones as well as a concussion. Aguilar Mondujano's family released a photo of him as well, in critical condition, hooked up to tubes in a hospital bed earlier this week. Friday evening, they held a vigil, but would not answer any questions. Previously, they said they believe the Hillsborough police officer didn't have enough training and don't feel the shooting was justified. That was Christine Pitawanich reporting. While the video gives us a better idea of what happened, there are still few details about how and why it happened. What we do know is Potter is a 20-year veteran of the department and a watch commander he's recovering. Aguilar Mondujano is still in the hospital. Now here's an update on an investigation out of Washington State. Last Friday, deputies with the Grand County Sheriff's Office believed they had stopped a potential mass shooting at the Gorge Amphitheater. Now, after further investigation, they do not think that's the case, seeing the suspect probably was not planning a mass shooting. However, during court appearance, the suspect, Jonathan Moody, faced several charges because he had a weapon. He pleaded not guilty. Moody has since been released. His next court date is scheduled for September 8th. The healthcare industry has been under a lot of extra stress the past few years. That also includes pharmacies, where increased demand and staffing issues have taken a toll. It can also cause a big problem for patients. Tim Gordon explains. 
This Rite Aid pharmacy at Northeast 60th and Prescott has been around for a while, serving people in the Coley neighborhood. For the past 10 years, it's where Renee Corbett has been going. I'm on heart medication, diabetes medication, and an antiviral that stops the progression of my disease. Getting prescriptions here was fine until recently. Corbett met us to tell us about it. And what's going on is that they closed the pharmacy unexpectedly last week without notification and I and other folks could not get our meds for four days. The prescriptions were filled sitting in a closed pharmacy. But the problem with that is this pharmacy had already processed those prescriptions so my antiviral is $280. My insurance had already paid for that so they weren't going to pay again. So that left me to not have my meds or pay $300 and seek reimbursement. Like other service industries, stresses and strains have burned out some pharmacists and pharmacy techs. So while the number of licensed pharmacists is actually up 3% in the past few years in Oregon. We may have a shortage of pharmacists willing to work in some settings, however. John Schnabel with the Board of Pharmacy is appreciative of hardworking pharmacists and says complaints about closures or long lines at pharmacies has dropped a bit lately. But that has become a problem. And if a patient does go without their medication because they can't get it out of a, a pharmacy, the board is concerned about that situation happen. Renee Corbett is not upset with the local Rite Aid folks. I feel bad for him because they got a lot of stress extra this week. And the manager here was very nice. Now the pharmacist is back. And Corbett says she told her she went on vacation and a replacement never showed up. Corbett tried over and over to get answers from Rite Aid corporate and never got a call back. I'm done with them. Never again. I can't be put in that position. I have a heart a stent. I could die without my heart medication. Tim Gordon, KGW News. Healthier Together. Sponsored by Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon. Students are going back to school in person again this year, and while a lot of things have changed, bullying, unfortunately, will still be there. And that's what we're focusing on in today's Healthier Together. Bullying, its long-term impacts, and what parents can do to help. About 20%, one in every five students, report being bullied. Dr. Mike Franz is the Senior Medical Director of Behavioral Health for Regents. He's increasingly concerned about the bullying happening online. Bullying now is, is almost synonymous with cyberbullying. Um, you know, traditional bullying can still occur, but uh, with the advent of social media and smartphones, unfortunately, we're seeing kids report about 20% of them are experiencing cyberbullying in any given year. Research suggests that kids and teens who are bullied over time are more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem. If your child is a bystander to bullying, that can have mental health impacts too. Studies show that students who witness bullying experience increased anxiety and depression, regardless of whether they support the bully or the person being bullied. That same study showed kids and teens who bully others are at higher risk for more intense antisocial behaviors like problems at school, substance use, and aggressive behavior. This is very real. I think, number one, it's for parents to uh, be aware of this issue, how prevalent it is. Dr. Franz says there are three main concerns when it comes to cyberbullying versus what many parents would think of as traditional in-school bullying. First, cyberbullying can be persistent. It's happening potentially 24-7. Social media runs 24-7. Kids are having access to their, their cell phones and um, other platforms um, throughout the day, unfortunately, sometimes throughout the night. And uh, it's hard to escape. Cyberbullying can also be permanent. When things get posted online on social media accounts, Sometimes they're there until it gets taken down and it never gets taken down. And finally, cyberbullying can be hard to notice. When it's online, it can be silent, especially to adults. Kids are using a lot of platforms that adults, parents, teachers are not using. And this can go sight unseen and not get spoken about. And we might miss it. So what can parents do? Well, it helps to start by making sure your child understands what bullying is. And Dr. Franz says, ask open-ended questions. As parents, we first need to be aware this is happening. Then we need to notice if we have any concern at all. We need to, again, approach our child and, and have open-ended questions, make it a safe place. Um, and probably even before that, be aware of how much social media access 
to have. Dr. Franz says that means monitoring cell phone and social media usage. Use parental controls that are appropriate for your child's age and maturity and be open with your child about expectations online. If bullying is happening, Dr. Franz suggests involving your child's school. And if you notice a change in your kid or teen, remember to keep communication open and reach out for help. Sleep, appetite, academic productivity, um, socialization or the lack thereof, then we need to think about getting them connected clinically again, starting with primary care. We'll have links to more helpful information online at kgw.com slash healthier together.